Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think I was introduced as a political consultant or some such. A rather underemployed one at the moment. I don't know if any of you are interested in uh, setting up some new institutions that you, you, you know who to ring. Um, uh, the, I'm, I'm addressing this topic really a fairly pragmatic way. Um, uh, I'm just going to comment a bit on where I think the various political parties are now after the election, and then I'm going to look back on the last 15 years to, to 1999 and see if something is happening there which is telling us uh, where we are. So I don't think one election in itself is ever of any significance much, uh, but several elections in a row can tell you whether some deeper trends are beginning to work. Um, the recent election uh, uh, obviously showed a lot of the effects of, 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 of the hardship, the austerity, uh, the cynicism, if you will. They're all the same type syndrome, um, which naturally comes out of six years of severe austerity and, and what that does to a population of the people, not just what it does to them and their lives, but what it does to them and their head and what it does to the whole society. And while Ireland, as a society, has reacted enormously, bravely, and with immense perseverance, steadiness, and courage, at the same time, there is the deepest of resentment for what we all had to do collectively. And that was shown in the very small, relatively low poll, just approximately 52% in the local elections that turned out uh, on that day. And coming out of it, Fianna Fáil, I think, comes out of it um, rather well um, uh, when, when, when everything is taken into consideration. Um, it was good for their morale and definitely good for their confidence, good for Michal Martin's leadership to anyone who had even a titchock of sense in the party. And becoming the biggest party in local government gives it a morale boost, it gives it a political boost, and it gives it an improved electoral base. They have a lot more councillors. They have loads of potential Doyle candidates. They have great numbers of young people, young women and young men, and in place now throughout the country. They've made very importantly for them valuable gains in Dublin, whereas you know the party doesn't have still a single TD, and nor does it have a, a European MEP after the, these elections. Saner heads, however, will realise that uh, you wouldn't want to overestimate. I've said it's hugely important in psychological and moral terms, but the rehabilitation of the party is still fragile and from its point of view does need to be nurtured very carefully. Looking at the actual result in numerical terms, it was way down in numbers of votes on 2009 while it was about the same percentage of the vote, but there was a much smaller vote. In fact, it exceeded their terrible day in 2011 by only 30,000 votes nationally. So, you know, it's, it, so in terms of votes in the box, the progress was, was small, but in terms of percentage of those that came out, it was very significant. And I think for them at the next election, you know, they have a lot to build on and a lot to grow and, and, and a reason to have courage and confidence that, that, that the road back is there for them. Nonetheless, critical for them will be the quality of the candidates they can put in the field. Uh, 2011 was like the Battle of Culloden for the Highlanders. It wiped out their leadership throughout the country. And, and, and with that wipeout of leadership, they lost 60 years of history, of tradition, of know-how, of knowledge, of, 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 of governing the country. And we're just all gone. And now they're talking about starting again with the, it's like a team that, like almost Manchester United after Munich, air crash, when they lost most of their, and they had to start again with the, the smaller team. So that's Fianna Fáil. If I were in, in their shoes, I'd be working really hard on getting the best possible candidates all over the country and trying to put together a, a team for the election, an election team, which would look like it's competing seriously for government. 
and look like, if it were elected, it could govern or be part of a government. That's the huge challenge for them. It's not so much the brand of the party, not even so much the politics of the party, I think. It's for them, it's the people they can put forward that will look the part. And I tell you, someone who's helped to fight a lot of general elections, there's nothing more critical than that when you come to the white heat of the month of campaigning. Sinn Féin had a seriously good election, uh, and if they can replicate it in the general election, it will confirm Sinn Féin's arrival as a major force on the political scene and as genuine contenders for power. Uh, in, in many, many ways, it's a very impressive, impressive party. What is interesting, though, is that once again, the party significantly underperformed on its uh, public opinion ratings. Uh, if you look at that, for the last several elections, they, their polling is significantly in advance of the actual votes in the box, which means, to my mind, there's an upward potential for them at all times. But it's interesting. Part of the reason is that their support comes from the demographics that don't vote uh, in very great numbers. That's one of the reasons, anyway. The other thing that these elections also showed is that still they are not very transfer-friendly. And that is something they have to fix as well. Their characteristic pragmatism in approach to politics, and by that I mean they remind me historically of what Fianna Fáil was in, in the 1920s and 1930s. They go a bit of the road with everybody. Uh, it, it's populism. It serves them very well. They're the anti-austerity agenda. They're not in government anywhere. They are in government, interestingly, in Northern Ireland, but they're handling that issue quite well, too. But in the next election, that's going to be examined in the white heat of the election. And the other parties will be putting an absolute focus on what their policies are and what their decisions. You cannot be against everything unpopular and for everything popular. You can if you're permanently in opposition, but this is a party which is moving towards becoming a party of government. And that's when the real political action starts. Their fact when going into government with Fine Gael is no doubt a significant relief uh, to Enda Kenny. And their desire to cuddle up to Fianna Fáil just might see Michal Martin beginning to assert his relationship boundaries or maybe feeling a little queasy. Though perhaps Mary Lou MacDonald's recent uh, news that Sinn Féin would like to find common ground with Labour could be an anti-emetic for the other two parties. However, there may be something in that, and I will re return to it. Labour, um, we've already heard from Noel, had a very bad election. There's no, no way you can um, put any kind of a gloss on that. It goes with a bad experience in government. They never appear to be happy in government uh, for them. Uh, it's not just this government, it's any government. It seems to be a party that thrives more in opposition. Uh, suffering within government because it cannot retain its principles. There's no party has more principles and more a grip on principles uh, of a love of them than the Labour Party has. It goes right back to its founding at the beginning of the last century. And those principles and ideals with the practicalities of running a modern economy in times of recession is, is, uh, is a difficult issue. It's almost as if the Labour Party was not designed to be in government. Of course, that doesn't, that doesn't apply in other countries, as you know, where Labour parties have been enormously successful in government and have been many times re-elected into government. Under their new leader now, and, and they have again another chance, a new leader, a new beginning, they have a chance to go to the people and say something like this. Have a fair look at us. This is what we have done to save the country. We played a major part in the recovery. What we're asking for now is a new term so that we can make sure that recovery takes firm hold in our country and is experienced fairly by everybody. Crucially, they have the opportunity to present themselves as a party with human emotion, 
with empathy because that is what's missing in an awful lot of what we see at the government today. And they must firmly claim credit for their share in the good things that are now coming through in an Ireland emerging from a cruel recession. Uh, the Labour Party is not good at claiming credit for the achievements it has a major part in bringing about. Uh, it's almost accentuating the negative rather than the positive. So it would be very interesting to see how Joan Burton and her new team tackle that issue. And they have 18 months to bring about a very significant change. Fine Gael, a conundrum. It permanently is. Uh, What I've said about it, and I've thought about it, perhaps, Theresa, maybe your department or some of your students uh, uh, do some thesis on why is it that Trinic Gael, one of the major democratic parties of the last century, and this one anywhere, has never been less than the second biggest party in Ireland? How, how come that it has never since 1926 been re-elected into government? And this is the seventh time it's been in government since the 1927 general election. It is an absolutely astounding conundrum. People put them in, but they never wanted to put them back. Every time. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps that's the answer. Yeah. I mean, this is something unique. Uh, you've had a great variety of leaders and a great variety of parties and so on. And for the great people, we could be opposite that. They'd say, we always only got government when we the fall would make a bags of it. So it was our job to put it right. And that's the answer to that. But I don't think either of those answers are a full and complete definition themselves. Something unique, yeah. I, I think it has something to do with the, with the founding of the party and the founding of the state because uh, Fine Gael, it actually, it's the Common Gael was the first government of the state that brought the country through the Civil War, set up the civil service, set up the Gardaí, set up everything, and dedicated themselves totally to the new state, fought a civil war to save it, and so on and so forth. And that was absolutely imbued within them. So it became a party which had a total commitment to the state, to the instruments of the state, and so on. Its main, its main opponent at that time, uh, De Valera's Fianna Fáil, they had a huge empathy with Ireland, but they had a dedication not to the state, which they saw to themselves in some way as a bastard entity because it wasn't what they wanted to come out of the War of Revolution. And they were interested in the nation, a different concept. It includes cultural and romantic ideas, going all the way back to the Fianna and Cúchulainn and so on. The very name of the party was taken from the early national anthem. It means the soldier, Fianna Fáil, the soldiers of Fáil, soldiers of destiny. That's the kind of thinking they had. So that, that was a, obviously a, a, a different type of a concept. Whereas, and so Fine Gael, whenever they go into government, they're almost the one party which are kind of carrying forward some of the mindset and the cultural fix of the Civil War era, which I think has disappeared in virtually every other way from the politics of Ireland and the thinking of the Irish people. So while the old Civil War politics are over, and I think they're going to be replaced with a different kind of politics, which I'll come back to, Fine Gael, in a sense, still inhabits that old era party that founded the state, established civil servants, first duties to the state. Their humanity, the politics of the party, their connection with the popular is kind of banished. They govern, if you like, almost as an extension of the civil service. The problem is that when you go to an election, it is a political party you go as. If you're with Fianna Fáil, Sinn Féin, Labour or Fine Gael, or whatever else, uh, you go with that party's piece of paper, that party's policy, and you ask for the support of the people. And the people vote for the party. Now, traditionally, as, 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 in the distant past, perhaps one party might have been able to form a government, but in recent times, after the election, the parties then 
make up a government and it typically has more than one party in it. So that, that, that is a key fact. So therefore, when you are governing, you must govern, not just with, you know, govern with intelligence, but not just intelligence for the sake of the government and for the economy and for that, those kind of concepts. You have to also govern with political intelligence because your party has to go back at the next election and knock at the doors. Again, as Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, Labour or Sinn Féin, and ask for the support. And if you've lost contact with the people in between, they will tell you where to go with your policies and make sure the door doesn't hit you on the way out. And that has happened, Fianna Gael, six times since 1932. Their idea of governing, the act of governing to the party, has something very sacrosanct about it. And it can't really, in the policy of the party, be contaminated with politics. They feel it has a kind of nobility in it. Um, it tends to be about government. It tends to be separate from the party. They lose that sense of the raw politics of the party. They sanitize the, the, the area around it. Um, they forget about what's coming down the track. And I see those exact same characteristics happening this time around, which kind of surprised me. Uh, the relationship between the party in government and the party in the people has become totally, the party in the country has become fractured. The relationship almost between the party in government and the party in the back benches has become fractured. And unless that is pulled together and reunited, because it is those party in the country, those county councillors, those activists, they have to go out and knock at the doors. And if they have been excluded virtually, totally, from the whole process of government, their ideas not being either courted or taken into account. They're in an extraordinary weak position to present that case with the emotional fortitude, strength and power that it has to be done. And consequently, you get this government which has become kind of morphed into an extension of the civil service type government, the permanent government, um, and politically it becomes a dead weight and is a disaster goes away to nurse its wounds, perhaps for another 12 years, that kind of thing. That has been the history of the party anyway. I still think, though, that you know, it, it, it's, it's strategically in a good position still to look at the next election uh, with some considerable uh, possibilities. Uh, it has to get away from this sacred, almost fetishistic position of being the party that does the business of the state to being the party that does the business of the nation and contacting closely with the people of the nation. They have been ineffective in elections since they went into government, by and large, with the exception of some very well-run by-elections. But the, if you just recall back to the presidential election, the party pulled 7% of the national vote some months after getting 36% of the vote in the general election. I'll tell you, that took some ingenuity to achieve a result like that. Um, the recent local elections, probably as an election campaign, was one of, my honest view, one of the worst I ever saw. And um, we had the Shannon referendum, Theresa referred to it. That was hardly a glorious effort for a party that actually brought it in as a significant and a major reform. But having said all that, they are still in a very key position to be an anchor part of the next government, whether it be along the model that, um, that um, has been suggested here or not. It, it could very well be. But for that, they have to reconnect with the party and reconnect with the people and reconnect with the concept that recovery is about the people and it is about fairness, and that everybody must share in it. It's not a case of 
let the, ri let the boats rise and those that are in them will be great and eventually everybody will get a grip of some kind of a handrail somewhere to scramble on. That is not the way this has to be done on this occasion. And um, they have to develop that practical sense of politics and learn how to govern with a political intelligence. It came naturally to Fianna Fáil going back to its early days that Fianna Fáil represented and was close to the nation, that spirit of the Irish people, whether they were in government or in opposition. They weren't the protectors and minders of the institutions of state, which is where the Fine Gael mindset was solidly set after the first 10 years. So I think that requires a rethink of a fairly fundamental nature, and it just amazes me how the mental attitudes almost jump generations. It's almost as if there's a genetic gene pool running up through, which goes from one generation to another. And you see new young bright TDs coming in, and shortly they're evincing the same attitudes as people who are going out the back door. Very, very interesting and very surprising. Well, that's their task for the next election, and Fine Gael will remain a very, very key part of what happens. And I would even venture to say, looking across the rest of the spectrum, the country really does need Fine Gael to get its act together and to be an effective force coming into the next election. It is vital in the national interest. I would say that, and I say that now as somebody who, following Joe Mulholland's advice, I'm speaking uh, in an objective way here. I am not trying to push the position of any party. I just want to say a few words on a more broader level, and picking up here, a lot of what Noel actually came to, which I found to be very, very interesting indeed. Um, civil war politics are over, and what is going to replace them? Um, uh, we are within Europe, and realistically speaking, it has to be the politics of the right and the left. And that's not going back to an old Cold War thinking. It's just the practical way. And the way I look at it now, and look at the way things are, it's the centre-right and the centre-left you're talking about. All, all politics are in, in, in the centre, but it is a very broad centre. And they coalesce, depending on their attitudes to different principal things. So I just had a look at Ireland, if you just impose that on it. And for the purpose of this, I said that the centre-right in Ireland, and I started in 99, so now I'm about 15 years, the centre-right in Ireland means Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, and the PDs are no longer there, but for a lot of that period, they were a significant player. That's the centre-right. And the centre-left, Labour Party, Sinn Féin, and the Green Party, they were all significant players of that. And see what happened. If you just imagine that they were the parties, though in that period, none of those groupings ever produced a government, so it was always bits and pieces across the divide. So th this is the way it happened for the centre-right over that period. I'm just going to throw out figures at you, but I mean, I'm going to put this up on Joe's website, and the figures will be there if any of you want to, to, to have them for whatever reason. But in 1999, that centre-right grouping was the first of the elections, and I'm combining local and national elections here, took 70% of the vote. Two years later, it was down to 68, 2% drop. And in 2004, general election, uh, uh, local and European elections, it was down another 5 to 63%. It jumped in 2007. I'd say, what about that later on? That was the great Bertie Ender. You know, the great last battle of Fianna, of Fianna Fáil under Bertie and the resurgence of Fianna Gael under Ender. Between the two of them, they sucked in virtually the huge amount of support into the two parties. It was the last time it happened, probably the last time it will ever happen. They're back to 72. But in 2009, um, uh, local election was down again to 58, which was um, five points down on, on 2004. In 2011, it went down another four points to 54. And in 2014, this year, another five points to 49. So if you take out the bump, that's a straight line down across um, seven elections, four and five points ago. So that's a set of facts. Over the period, a decline from 70% to uh, 49, a decline of 21%. Now, what happened on the left? Uh, a trend in the other direction, 
it must be said, <clears throat> not as consistent and not as well established. Over the same seven elections, the group did as follows. In 1999, it was 17% of the vote between that, those three entities. That was Labour, Sinn Féin, and the Greens. In 2002, general election, they went up to 21%. In 2004, it went up to 23%. And in 2007, stabilized, if you like, at 22%. In 2009, up to 24%. In 2011, it had a, a great jump up to 31%. And this year, fell back to 24%. So if you take this year from the beginning, it increased 7 percentage points over the 15-year period. The 2000 level was the Gilmore Gale, that great jump which Labour got. Um, now... The differential between so observe, the differential between the centre left and the centre right, 28 well, um, over the period was 28 percent. If you took the 21 to the right, came down, and the 20, that's seven Labour, the others went up. Are you telling me to feed that? Yeah, let me finish it. Yeah. Others um, moved. Others had a big election this summer. And prior to that, virtually no significant change. If you took the beginning to 2011, there's only 2% change. There's a big jump this year. I, I would say that we have to wait for another election to see how that's going to settle. You can say nothing on the result of one election. <clears throat> um, and I do believe our government will continue to be provided by parties because <clears throat> I don't think our experience with independence has been that good. In recent times, each independent mean, means a special deal for some constituency. And the idea of having 20 or 30 special deals banging one another at every crossroads in Ireland would be a, a, a kind of a ridiculous concept. Not that that would uh, necessarily rule it out. <clears throat> Over the general elections, the same trend happened. In general elections, on the right went from 68 down to 54 and the left went from 21 up to 31. So I put the two together and there was a 24% swing, similar enough to the other thing. And I'm just knocking this together. And over that period, I'll just say this to Theresa, in general elections, the, the voting has increased. So I think the people are engaging more rather than less with the electoral process. 62% voted in 2002. It was up to 67% in 2007. These were general elections. And up to 70% in 2011. And my guess will be it'll, it'll beat 70% at the next general election because I think there'll be a lot of commitment in people to vote. Um, the system is hardwired against change. To run a party, you need a bit of money and you need a resource. You cannot get part of a rapturous money. It's based on your performance in the last election, so you have to be a party already to get the money. And our fundraising laws have now been so changed that it is impossible to fundraise the money to start a political party, in my opinion. So catch-22, the system, unless a party can come out of groupings of independence or something, and I think there's a problem with that because the concept of the discipline of a party and the concept of the independent mindset, I think, are in contradistinction with one another. Issues in Europe, and I'll just leave those out in order to finish this, but there are very significant lessons in the European elections about Europe. And that plane crash and everything around what it represents just has to remind us again of the absolute and essential importance of the European Union for giving us the peace and stability that we've had and maintaining it into the future. And to assume that we are guaranteed a peaceful future would be historically an unsustainable assumption to make. Now, to finalize about Ireland, I would say that the logic of the trends I have spoken to you, that in the logic of that, it is the destiny of Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil increasingly to come together, whatever form that will take. But if you look at the, to stay in power and to exercise their power, I think the votes and the voters are telling the parties that that is what should happen. And they are also telling Labour and Sinn Féin to do likewise. So I would think over 15 years, that's what the public are saying by their votes. 
In both cases, history stands massively in the ways of these developments coming about. However, we can only learn from our past. It is in the present and the future that we must live and that we must vote. And I think the voters are speaking inexorably on the matter. Thank you very much.